Section 78 of The Mysteries of London, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anthony Gerges. The Mysteries of London, Volume 3 by George W. M. Reynolds. Three Months After Marriage. Sir Christopher Blunt was pacing his drawing room in a very agitated manner, and the expression of his countenance was so ludicrous in its reflections of the thoughts that were stirring within his breast that it was impossible to say whether he was influenced by commingled hope and suspense on the one hand, or by fear and shame on the other. It was pretty evident that he had not been out all day, for he was unshaven and he wore the light blue dressing gown, the bright red trousers, and the scarlet silk cap which his dear wife had devised as a most becoming morning costume, but which gave him the appearance of a muscle man, quack doctor, as the golden lustre of the handsome lamp brought forth all the flaunting effects of the garb. Advancing towards the timepiece, Sir Christopher compared his watch with that dial. A quarter to nine, he murmured to himself as he restored the huge gold repeater to its fob and the doctors have been an hour with her already well i never heard of such a thing before three months after marriage it's impossible quite impossible dr wagtail is a very clever man no doubt but he's wrong for once in his life if it was six or seven months now one might suppose it a premature birth but three months and the worthy knight paced the apartment in a manner which showed that he didn't know what the deuce to make of it. Well, he continued again, speaking in a murmuring tone after a short pause, it may be so after all, for really science does discover such wonderful things nowadays, and the world seems to undergo so many strange changes, that upon my word I should not be surprised at all if, on going out some morning, I was to see the people walking on their heads along German Street. Ah, things weren't like this when I was a boy, but then I must recollect that I live in a fashionable quarter of the town now, and ladies at the West End ain't like those vulgar citizens' as wives. Thank God that I didn't get in for port -sucken. It was quite enough to have filled the high and responsible office of sheriff, and to have received the distinguished honor of knighthood. But three months! exclaimed Sir Christopher, interrupting himself and flying back with ludicrous abruptness to the idea that was uppermost in his mind. Three months, and after all, who knows, but that it's the fashion of the West End, and I'm sure that if it is, I shall be very glad that it has happened so, and yet the most extraordinary part of the business is that, when I suspected something of the kind, and just hinted at it to Lady Blunt, she she scratched my face to pieces for me very extraordinary indeed sir christopher now became lost in a maze of conjecture vague suspicion and bewilderment through which he certainly could not find his way and heaven only knows how long he might have remained in the labyrinth had not dr wagtail appeared to his rescue well doctor exclaimed the knight hastening to meet the physician my dear christopher i congratulate you said dr wagtail considering it decent and becoming to assure a joyous and smirking expression of countenance for the occasion while he wrung the knight's hand with most affectionate warmth for it is my duty he continued now suddenly adopting the pompous and important style of the fashionable physician to a rich family for it is my duty sir christopher to announce to you that you are the happy father of a charming boy with whom her ladyship has been kind enough to present you a boy a eh, doctor faltered the knight but of course it isn't i mean it can't be a a full-grown child well my dear sir christopher responded dr wagtail who perfectly understood where the shoe pinched from what mr snipekin the talented and much sought after accoucher whom i deemed it prudent to call in just now from what mr snipekin says sir christopher i do believe that the dear little creature has come a little before his time but pray don't make yourself uneasy on that account my dear sir christopher for the sweet baby is in no danger and an uncommonly fine child to be sure then it is a little before its time doctor eh said sir christopher 
but doctor you and me are old friends and you can speak candidly you know and the truth is you must remember that that our marriage o only took place three months ago and it seems to me rather unusual not that i suspect your lady blunt virtue for a moment uh, on the contrary i know her to be a perfect paragon of morality a at the same time three months doctor and a fine boy my dear sir christopher responded dr wagtail foreseeing that the amount of his fee would depend vastly upon the state of mind in which the knight might be when he should give it and acting moreover upon his favourite principle of humouring the whims and wishes of all persons with whom he had any professional connection my dear sir christopher he said looking very solemn indeed your avocations in the world have not allowed you time to dive into the mysteries of science and investigate the arcana of learning much less to pursue with sesquipedalian regularity the routine of that course of study which in the abstract and also considered in a purely professional point of view and having due regard to the wonders of physiological science in fact ahem you understand me sir christopher e e yes doctor dealt forth the bewildered knight but i think you were going to satisfy me you know about the three months and a fine boy doctor i was coming to that point my dear sir christopher said dr wagtail in fact i was about to observe that physiology properly considered in its etymological signification comprehends the entire science of nature but i must impress upon your mind sir christopher that the ratiocinative properties of modern physicians have induced them doubtless after much profound cognition to restrict the term that department of physical knowledge relating referring and belonging exclusively to organic existence and thus sir christopher ahem you follow me oh quite easy indeed returned the knight wondering in his own mind whether it were dog latin that stunned his ears and also how one individual could possibly pick up and retain such an immense amount of knowledge but the point was doctor precisely my dear christopher exclaimed the physician looking as wise as all the seven sages of greece put together it was to that very point which i was coming but i thought that a detailed and full explanation would prove most satisfactory to you oh decidedly doctor and i'm sure very much obliged to you for taking the trouble to uh to well then my dear christopher interrupted the fashionable physician all my premises being granted and the arguments which i have adducted being fully admitted i think that the demonstration is easy enough consequently sir christopher it is quite apparent that a child may be born three months after marriage at the same time i think i can assure you that in future your excellent and amiable lady will not be quite so premature in her accouchements it is not unusual then doctor among your female patients said sir christopher who is not entirely satisfied yet it is by no means unusual that a first child should be born a few months after marriage my dear sir christopher answered the physician and perhaps uh, perhaps it's rather fashionable than otherwise asked the knight in a hesitating manner well i don't know what it is sir christopher replied dr wagtail taking a pinch of snuff and now that your mind is completely set on rest on this point as indeed it must and ought to be after the full and professional explanation which i have given you i will return to the chamber of your amiable and excellent lady and see whether you can be permitted to visit her for a few moments do my dear doctor and doctor cried the knight as a sudden idea struck him pray don't i mean it's not necessary to let lady blunt know that that in a word that i asked you any questions oh certainly not my dear christopher exclaimed the physician and he then quitted the room well thought the knight to himself as soon as he was again alone and so i am the father the happy father and he made a slight grimace of a fine boy a fine boy eh upon my honour i'm very glad very glad indeed a son and heir a little christopher how very kind of my dear wife it is a tie which will bind us together perhaps soften her temper a little and make her more sparing in the use of her finger-nails <laughs>
well if it's only for that the coming of this child will be a great blessing a very great blessing but i really do wish the dear babe had made its appearance about six months later not that it matters much seeing that i must be its father and that the thing is rather fashionable than otherwise besides dr wagtail is such a clever man such a very clever man and his explanation was so completely satisfactory so very lucid and clear a fool might understand it well i really ought to be a very happy fellow but all the knight's attempts at self-persuasion and self-consolation were futile there was a weight upon his spirits that he could not throw off and in the depths of his secret soul there was an awful misgiving to the existence of which he vainly endeavoured to blind his mental vision he strove to be gay he tried to establish the conviction that he was perfectly happy and contented he did all that he could to make himself admit to himself that the doctor's reasoning was conclusive still he could not shut down from his heart the ever-recurring thought that the physician's argument might be very conclusive indeed but that he was totally unable to understand a word of it then came the fear of ridicule and this was the most galling sentiment of all but on the other hand there was an apprehension which was not without its weight namely the anger of his wife in case she should discover that he had dared to doubt her virtue thus by the time the doctor came back the silly old gentleman had determined to take matters just as he found them and though half suspecting that there was something wrong in the business he resolved to maintain as contented an air as possible as the only means of combating ridicule should he experience it or of quieting his wife should she hear of anything to excite her irritability we are getting on so well my dear sir christopher said the physician that we can see you for a few minutes but we cannot bear any loud speaking as yet and we establish it as a condition that you do not make an attempt to kiss our child more than once for fear you should set it crying and make our headache sir christopher attempted a pleasant smile and followed dr wagtail to the chamber of the indisposed lady the moment the door was opened the shrill but nevertheless apparently half stifled cry of a new-born child saluted the knight's ears and hastening up to the bed he bent over and kissed his wife see what heaven has sent us sir christopher said the lady in a low and weak voice well suited to the solemnity of her observation and slightly uncovering the bedclothes she exhibited a tiny object looking amazingly red but which she assured him was the sweetest little face in the world that it is the pretty creature observed a hoarse voice which appeared to emanate from the chimney but which in reality came no further off than the fireplace and belonged to an elderly woman of tremendous copulency who was arranging some baby linen on a clothes horse i've nussed a many ladies continued the stout proprietress of the hoarse voice but never such a patient dear as yourn sir christopher and i never see such an angel at its birth as that baby why continued the woman advancing towards the knight and giving him a good long stare while potent odours of gin assailed his nostrils all the while i do declare that the baby is as like his father as he can be sir christopher grinned horribly a ghastly smile and slipped half a guinea into the nurse's hand at which proof of his generosity she dropped him a curtsey that shook the house so profoundly as nearly to drop her through the floor yes the baby is as like you sir as two peas is like each other continued the nurse while dr wagtail and the accoucher exchanged rapid but intelligent glances at the excellence of the idea and sir christopher grunted like a leaned pig which has just put its snout upon the right card in a show i'm sure sir you ought to be very much obliged to missus for presenting you with such a cherub poor dear she had a sad time of it but she bore it like a saint as she is won't you let master have just one kiss at the little dear my lady the saint was just at that moment wondering whether the child as it grew up would bear any resemblance to a certain tall footman in a certain family at the west end but why such an idea should enter her head we must leave to the readers to divine the nurse repeated her question adding do let the little dear's pa just kiss it once and then we must turn him out you know ma'am for the present yes sir christopher you may kiss the little cherub if you like said lady blunt in a tone which was meant to impress on her husband's mind a full sense of the favour conferred upon him but pray 
Don't make the little child squeal out, for you're so rough. The knight accordingly touched the babe with his lips, which he smacked to make believe that the kiss was a hearty one in spite of his wife's injunction, and this ceremony being completed, he was turned out of the room by the nurse, whose power on such occasions amounts, as all fathers know, to an absolute despotism. The nurse is a species exhibiting but little variety. Stout and in good spirits she must always be, and bottled stout and ardent spirit she highly esteems. She, moreover, has an excellent appetite and is fond of making meals in the course of the day. She awakes at five or six in the morning and makes herself strong hot coffee and a couple of rounds of toast, putting a great deal of sugar to the former and a vast quantity of butter to the latter. At nine she is ready for her breakfast, the first meal not being so denominated, and in fact considered as nothing at all if her mistress be awake the nurse will amuse her with innumerable stories relative to her former places and she will not fail to make herself out the very best nurse in the world she will describe how one lady was inconsolable because she could not have her at the desired time how another lady would eat nothing unless prepared by the said nurse's own hands how a third would have died if it had not been for her care and attention and how she never slept a wink nor put her clothes off once for a whole month while in attendance upon another lady then she is sure to be well connected and to have seen better days and if asked for her address she is certain to reply lord bless you my dear all you have to do is send and inquire for me in such and such a street and anybody will tell you where i live in fact she is as well known in her quarter of the town as the queen is at pimilico but to continue the category of meals at eleven o'clock she is quite prepared for a mutton chop and half a pint of stout and she forces a basin of gruel down her mistress's throat accompanied with many a poor dear i'm sure you mustn't want it at two o'clock she has a good appetite for her dinner and then she manages to get on pretty comfortably till tea-time the nurse is very fond of her tea and likes it strong after tea as her mistress most likely sleeps she gets hold of an odd volume of a romance or a newspaper not more than a week old and it is ten to one that she believes every word she reads in both if her mistress happens to be awake the nurse will comment upon what she reads the newspaper especially is sure to set her talking on the hardness of the times and arouse all her reminiscences of when she was a gal she will often express her mysterious wonder at what the world is coming to and invariably speaks as if everything has undergone a great deal of change for the worst she is sure to know a poor family whom she is mainly instrumental in saving from starvation and she is equally certain to descant upon the necessity of sobriety and frugality among the working classes then she remembers that it is time for missus to take her medicine but she goes to the shelf or the cupboard she stays a little longer there than is quite necessary to pour out the medicine aforesaid and as she approaches the bed to administer the same she wipes her mouth with the back of her hand and her eyes are observed to water the invalid lady may now think her stars if she be not assailed with an odor of ardent spirit while she receives her medicine from the hand of the nurse while the time passes away somehow or another until the supper hour and it is a remarkable fact that the nurse never seems wearied of the monotony of her avocation but then in the evening she manages to get half an hour's chat with the servants down the stairs and the chat is rendered the more pleasant by a little drop of something short out of a black bottle which the cook mysteriously produces from the cupboard on these occasions the nurse exhibits all her importance she assures the listening domestics that it was very fortunate she happened to be sent for to attend upon mrs as if any other nurse had been called in the results would have been most unpleasantly different she then expresses her opinion of the medical attendant and her estimation of this gentleman is invariably regulated by the amount of his liberality towards her if he gave her the odd shillings which accompanied the sovereigns of the little piece of paper containing the fee then he is sure to be a very clever man indeed but if he forgot this important duty then in the nurse's estimation he is certain to be a most unfit doctor to call in and it was quite a wonder that he didn't kill poor dear old missus 
having thus delivered her opinion which is received as gospel by the servants she hastens up the stairs again and relates to her mistress her own version of the conversation which has taken place down below after supper she no longer partakes of ardent spirit on the sly and unblushingly brews herself a potent glass but then she is sure to have an excuse such a dreadful pain in the stomach or a bad cold and her mistress whose peace of mind depends on keeping her attendant in a good humour says in a mild languid voice do make yourself comfortable nurse and the nurse obeys the hint to the very letter the liquor induces her to descend upon spirits in general and she is sure to inform her mistress that the duke of wellington doesn't sell near such good things as the duck and drake but that the beautifulest gin is in the public round the corner sometimes and this is one of the worst features in her character the nurse will take it into her head to relate gloomy stories to her mistress and once she gets on this subject the devil himself could not stop her she tells how she knew a lady who went on very well for ten days and then popped off all of a sudden or else she was once in a house which caught on fire in the middle of the night and the poor lady and child were burned to death if the husband should happen to be out late the nurse when she is in this gloomy vein talks mysteriously of the danger of the streets and says how she knew a gentleman who was run over by an omnibus during the fog but in justice to the nurse we must observe that these horrible subjects are not very frequently touched on by her and only when she gets somewhat maudlin with too much ardent spirit or bottled stout for the first week she is in her place no one comes to see her but in the course of the second she is visited by her married daughter and her married daughter's eldest girl during the third week the nurse is constantly wanted by people who come to see her or inquire for her and at the beginning of the fourth the front doorbell is rung frantically and the nurse hears with a countenance so innocent that it is almost impossible to think she has prearranged the whole matter that mrs so-and-so whom she has pledged herself to attend upon is just taken in labour and she the nurse must go to her directly her mistress is by this time well enough to do without her and the nurse receives her full month's wages for three weeks attendance but let us return to sir christopher blunt whom we left at that pleasant point when having undergone the ceremony of embracing the babe which according to his lady's account heaven has sent him he wended his way back to the drawing-room at that precise moment sir christopher would have given just one half of his fortune to be enabled to undo all that he had done three months previously he had married in haste and he now repented at leisure but it has gone too late to retract and he found to his infinite mortification that he must grin and bear it the accoucher shortly entered the room to report that all was going on as well as could be expected and having received his fee he took his departure soon afterwards the pompous and self-sufficient dr wagtail made his appearance and received his fee which out of sheer ostentation the knight rendered as liberal as the physician had anticipated these little matters being disposed of sir christopher rang the bell ordered up a bottle of claret and was about to console himself with the solitary enjoyment of the same when an astounding double knock and tremendous ring at the front door startled him so fearfully that he spilt the wine over his red trousers and nearly upset the table on which his elbow was leaning who can this be he exclaimed aloud captain o'blunderbuss cried the footman throwing open the door as wide as possible to avoid ingress to the swaggering officer End of the three months' marriage. End of section seventy eight. Section seventy nine of the Mysteries of London, Volume Three. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gary B. Clayton. The Mysteries of London, Volume 3, by George W. M. Reynolds. The Knight and the Captain. Captain O'Blunderbuss, murmured Sir Christopher in a faint tone, as he sank back dismayed into his seat. Be the powers, and how are ye, my hearty old cock, was the polite salutation of the gallant gentleman, as, advancing close up to the knight, he grasped his hand and shook it with as much energy as if he were a policeman 
carrying off a starving mendicant to the station-house for the heinous crime of begging thank you captain i'm i'm pretty well responded sir christopher well that's a blessing be jesus cried the captain coolly taking a seat is a claret that you're after drinking sir christopher he demanded taking up the bottle and holding it between his eyes and the lamp elegant stuff in its way but not my lush have you no potine in the house sir christopher potine replied the knight not understanding the name nor half liking the intrusion is it you sir christopher that don't know what real irish potine is cried the captain why there's never a child in old ireland that can't spill potheen whisky sir christopher whisky but i'll save you the trouble of ringing for it yourself and with these words captain o'blunderbuss applied his hand most vigorously to the bell pole the footman answered the summons your master says sir exclaimed the captain that you have to bring up a bottle of the best irish whisky rail potheen in a tumbler with a spoon a lemon hot water and sugar and looked sharp about it too the domestic retired and sir christopher stared in amazement at the captain for the worthy knight was so astounded by the free and easy manners of his visitor that he was not quite certain whether he sir christopher blunt was actually in his own house at the moment or whether he was in some public coffee-room where every one had a right to order the waiter about as he chose i hope you're not offended with me sir christopher by making myself at home said the captain but it isn't me that's the boy to stand on in his ceremony the knight thought that his visitor could never have said a truer thing in his life not i be jesus continued captain o'blunderbuss but then i'm the man to let others do the same with me and if you should ever find yourself in the wilds of Connemara, sir christopher just ask the first naked urchin you meet with to show the way to blunderbuss park and see if i don't treat you as you deserve to be treated blood and mother it's me that keeps open house save when the sheriff's officers are prowling about the neighbourhood which is generally from the first of january to the thirty-first of december every year the servant now made his appearance with the whisky and the etceteras which the gallant gentleman had ordered and the said gallant gentleman straightway began to brew himself some toddy with the air of an individual who had had nothing stronger than mild ale to drink all day long may i request to be informed began sir christopher his courage reviving now that the captain's visit appeared to be one altogether of an amicable nature faith and is it to be informed ye'd be ejaculated a blunderbuss as he stirred his whisky and water up with a spoon but don't alarm yourself sir christopher my call this evening was merely just to ask ye how you do and present you with a little note from that rail broth of a boy mr frank curtis frank my nephew exclaimed sir christopher what can he want with me surely tis not to congratulate but no he can't have heard of that yet be the powders and is there anything to congratulate you upon sir christopher cried the captain have ye been made a baronet or an elected an alderman i would have you know captain o'blunderbuss said the knight in a solemn tone that i was once so unadvised as to put up for port sock and bay jesus have nothing to do with a pot it lies heavy on the stomach my friend interrupted a gallant officer drink potine and you'll never grow old nor yet grey but we were speaking of congratulations is it possible your dear wife has tumbled down the stairs and broken her neck or has she presented ye with a pledge of her affliction since you must know captain o'blunderbuss it is it's the latter i give ye joy old brick vociferated a gallant officer and seizing sir christopher's hand he subjected it to such a process of violent shaking that the victim almost yelled out in agony but from what frank told me continued the captain at length relinquishing the hand which he had so unmercifully squeezed i thought you hadn't been married long enough for such a happy event to take place however i wish you joy me friend and now to business read this little bit of a note and ye'll be charmed with the kind way in which frank could have specs of ye the knight received the letter which the captain handed to him 
but ere he had time to break the seal the door opened and a nurse made her appearance well nurse what is it demanded sir christopher please sir was the reply mrs wants to know who it is has come with such a tremendous knock and ring that it has set her poor head aching ready to split and the blessed baby crying as if he wasn't fit tell your mistress nurse exclaimed the visitor in an imperious tone that is captain o'blundibus of o'blundibus park ireland with an awful rattling of the r's and present my best respects to your lady and the baby thank you sir replied the nurse but missus says sir christopher please that she hopes you won't make no noise with the house very well very well my good woman exclaimed the knight hastily tell your mistress i shall not be engaged long and will come up and see her presently very good sir and the nurse withdrew sir christopher then proceeded to open the letter but as was with trembling hands for the visit of the nurse had thrown him into a most unpleasant state of nervousness he being well aware that he should receive a blowing up on account of the captain's call although no one could possibly wish more devoutly than himself that such a call had not taken place you tremble sir christopher cried the captain but there's no need to be alarmed for your nephew hasn't sent you a challenge so let your mind be at peace and read the little note at your leisure i'm in no hurry for an hour or two and indeed the captain appeared to be quite comfortable for he brewed himself a second glass of whisky and water threw some coals upon the fire and trimmed the lamp in such a way that the flame rose above the globe meanwhile sir christopher perused the letter with great attention and did not altogether seem to relish its contents i really cannot oblige my nephew in this respect he said fidgeting the paper about in his hands the truth is he has not behaved altogether well to me nor to lady blunt and if i was to do this for him lady blunt would be so angry he must fight his own way in the world captain o'blunderbuss as i did for i have no hesitation to admit that i rose from nothing indeed i glory in the fact and having filled the high and responsible office of sheriff with credit to myself and advantage to my fellow citizens damn the high office of sheriff exclaimed the gallant gentleman striking his fist upon the table i want my money and it isn't captor o'blunderbuss that you'll be after putting off in this snaking fashion but my dear sir began the knight in a tone of gentle remonstrance i don't owe you the money by jesus but your nevy does and therefore it's all in the family cried the captain that is a proposition i cannot agree to my dear sir returned the knight you mean to differ from me demanded the captain looking desperately ferocious why as for that i i you mean to differ from me i repeat ex vociferated captain o'blunderbuss again striking the table with his fist but so violently this time that the bottles and glasses danced a hornpipe answer me that sir christopher i don't wish to offend you captain i couldn't wish to do that but added a knight i must beg leave most respectfully to dissent from the proposition that i am in any way answerable for the debts of mr curtis and since he has married a lady of fortune let him be candid with her at once and is it candid that he's to be when the wife would kick up hell and blazes cried o'blunderbuss but i tell you pretty frankly my friend that if you don't shell out the seven hundred pounds seven hundred ejaculated sir christopher it says only five hundred in the letter i don't care two raps for the letter answered the captain all i know is that mr frank curtis your nevy had seven hundred of me and be jesus i'll have seven hundred of you it can't be done sir christopher said doggedly then be the holy poker i'll shoot ye to-morrow morning vociferated the gallant officer so name your friend and i'll take care that ye shan't be after shirking this time as ye did when you had me mate my friend Mother. really captain o'blunderbuss this strange conduct on your part is is stammered the knight scarcely knowing what to do or say while his countenance became elongated to an awful extent strange strange do you say exclaimed the captain why you're adding insult to injury man 
but don't deserve yourself ye don't come to counterfeit a crank over me by jesus i'm not the boy to be bullied after his fashion sir christopher so shell out the eight hundred or be the lord harry eight hundred murmured the miserable knight now cruelly alarmed at the vociferous manner and the progressive attempt at extortion on the part of his visitor eight hundred is what i lent and eight hundred is what i'll have back said the captain in a determined tone and if you're after denying your debts of honor sir christopher i'll make such an example of ye as shall let all the world know what ye are as soon as i've shot ye dead which i'll do in the morning you surely wouldn't commit such a crime without without just provocation urged the knight in a coaxing manner i'll not hear another word of paltry excuse sirrah replied the captain starting from his seat and if the money isn't forthcoming in the twinkling of a bedpost i'll flay ye first and shoot ye afterwards oh dear oh dear says the wretched sir christopher what shall i do i wouldn't mind the five hundred that my nephew asked for since he promises so faithfully to pay me again but eight hundred nine thundered the captain do you mean to tell me as good as that i'm a liar and that i can't recollect the mounts be jesus i never was so insulted in my life and nothing but blood can wash it away blood murmured sir christopher my blood and i the father of a family as i may say so much more the dishonorable for ye to dispute a just debt and try to shook off this bastardly fashion cried the captain twirling his moustache and eyeing sir christopher in a way which made the latter tremble in every limb i always thought that ye was a man famous for your straightforward dealings but now i'm deserved grossly deserved and i'll send my friend to ye to-morrow morning before you've had time to break the shell of your first egg at breakfast well captain to oblige you said sir christopher i don't mind if i write a cheque for five hundred pounds but i positively will give no more i won't indeed i can't put down the paltry five hundred then on the draft exclaimed the captain and i'll make mr curtis fork me out the rest at his convenience the miserable sir christopher though feeling that he had been completely bullied into the settlement of the demand made upon him nevertheless stood in such an awful dismay of the warlike irishman that he wrote a check for the five hundred pounds which said check the captain secured about his person declaring and now my friend i look over all the insulting words you have applied to me this evening but be the power if i hadn't a great respect for you i'd make a mummy of ye before ye was twelve hours older having thus spoken the captain tossed off the remainder of his whisky and water shook the knight violently by the hand once more and took his departure just as the nurse was coming down to desire that sir christopher would get rid of his desk and send up the keys of the wine cellar to his ladyship now strange as it may appear to the reader considering all that they know relative to the character of captain o'blunderbuss it is nevertheless a fact that he never once thought of appropriating to his own use the amount just extorted from the knight he was a man who would not hesitate to get into debt without the least intention of ever paying the same he moreover thought that he had accomplished a highly meritorious deed in extorting the five hundred pounds from sir christopher but he was honourable after his own fashion that is to say he would scorn to perpetrate an actual robbery or to betray the trust reposed in him by an accomplice he was in fact one of those curious but not uncommon beings who might be trusted with a thousand pounds to convey to the bank for a friend but who would borrow eighteen pence without the remotest intention of ever repaying it and who thought that the most brilliant act a gentleman could achieve was to choose a creditor accordingly the clock had scarcely struck eleven and frank curtis was already beginning to get uneasy when the captain's thundering knock at the front door in baker street proclaimed his return and in a few moments the young gentleman was made acquainted with the success experienced by his friend and now be the holy poker we'll make a night of it said the captain when the front door having been duly secured the two worthies were once more seated in the dining-room 
and it's me myself that'll tell you stories and sing you real irish songs to keep you awake my boy and a night they did make of it heaven knows and tremendous inroads were effected upon the supply of gin then in the garrison as the captain now termed the house such lies too as the captain and frank curtis told each other until the latter gentleman began to entertain the pleasing idea that the room was spinning round and that there were four candles on the table instead of two the gallant officer on the other hand carried his liquor like a man who was inaccessible to its inebriating fumes and when curtis fell dead drunk upon the carpet the captain considerately picked him up tossed him over his shoulder as if he was a sack of potatoes and thus transported him to the door of his wife's bedroom at which he deposited the senseless gentleman having intimated in stentorious tones that mrs curtis would do well to rise and look to her husband the captain then went downstairs again finished the bottle last opened and throwing himself on a sofa fell into a sound sleep end of section seventy nine Recording by Gary B. Clayton. Section 80 of The Mysteries of London, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Anthony Gerges. The Mysteries of London, Volume 3 by George W. M. Reynolds tim the snammer and josh peddler out on business he who delights in wandering amongst the mazes of the mighty city of london this wilderness of brick and mortar and who can view with the eye of a philosopher or a moralizer the various phases in which the metropolis is to be considered may find ample food for reflection and much changing interest of scene if he post himself at that point in the borough of southwark called newington butts from this point diverge Blackman Street and Newington Road, the Borough Road, and Horsemonger Lane. Blackman Street and the Newington Road constitute the great thoroughfare between London Bridge and the Elephant and Castle Tavern, and incalculable are the multitudes, innumerable are the vehicles which pass along the busy way. Oh, so busy, because the love of money and the love of pleasure cause all whose comings and goings, those hurryings hither and thither, those departures and those returns what a tremendous conflict of interests what a wondrous striving to accomplish objects in view what an energy what an activity what an unwearied industry are denoted by a great thoroughfare like this nor less does that bustle speak of recreation and enjoyment parties of pleasure to end in dissipation amusement diversion and holidays too often to be dearly paid for thereafter close by newington butts you behold a portion of the wall of the bench prison with its chevaux de frise denoting rather the criminal prison than a place of confinement for unfortunate person what a horrible cruelty it is to incarcerate men who are unable to liquidate their liabilities as if such immurement would place within the reach the philosopher's stone where one dishonest debtor finds his way thither a dozen human beings who are enclosed within that gloomy wall would gladly willingly acquit themselves of their responsibilities if they had the means and shall the law be so framed that in order to punish one it must cruelly oppress twelve individuals is such a principle consistent with common sense justice or civilization many and many a heart has been broken within those walls many and many a fine spirit has been crushed down to the very dust and the man who went into that prison with honorable feelings and generous sympathies has gone forth prepared to play the part of a sneaking swindler for a creditor to lock his debtor up in prison is the same as if a master took away the tools from a mechanic and said now do your work as usual the legislature does not state this it allows an expensive process to take place so that the debtor who cannot originally pay fifty for instance has his liabilities immediately increased to sixty then when responding negatively to the demand for this larger sum he is taken away from the avocations by pursuing which he might obtain the means to settle with his creditor and is thrown into prison the routine is precisely this if a person cannot pay a debt you increase it for him and having increased it you tie his hands so that he shall never have no chance of paying it at all merciful heavens is this common sense the system of imprisonment for debt falls trebly hard upon the poor 
The gentleman, though reduced himself, has friends who can assist him, but the poor are too poor to aid each other. Then money can purchase bail when a schedule has been filed in the insolvencies court, but the poor man must languish in prison until his hearing. Oh, the advantages of the wealth or wealthy connections in this mercenary land! Oh, the benefits of being by birth a gentleman! It was about ten o'clock in the evening when Tim the Snammer and Josh Pedler encountered each other by appointment at Newington Butts, and, as it was yet too early for the business which they had in hand, they repaired to a public house hard by where they drank porter, smoked pipes, and conversed, until the clock in the taproom denoted the hour of eleven. They then rose, paid their score, and took their departure, bending their way into Horsemonger Lane. Tim the Snammer now fell a few paces behind his comrade, Josh Pedler, who hurried a short distance up the lane and stopped at the door of a house of mean, sordid, and sombre appearance. He knocked at the door, which was opened by an old and hideous-looking woman, holding in her hand a candle, by the light of which she surveyed the visitor in a very suspicious manner. "'I want to speak to the gentleman of the name of Bones which lives here.' said Josh, placing his foot with apparent carelessness, in such a way over the threshold that the door might not be shut against his inclination. "'Nah, such a person don't live here,' returned the woman gruffly, and she was about to close the door when Josh again addressed her. "'Well,' said he, "'if he don't pass by that name here, he does by another, and it's all the same. We ain't particular, ma'am, as to names, but my business is particular, though, and I've got an appointment with Mr. Benjamin Bones, or Old Death, or whatever else he calls hisself, or is called by others. It ain't no use to stand and bother me, my good old man, said the woman, cause vas, no such a person lives here, I tell you, and I don't know such a person by such a name at all. Humbug, cried Josh, and giving a low short whistle, he pushed into the house. A moment had not yet elapsed where Tim the Snammer was at his heel. The door was forcibly closed, the candle was wrestled from the old woman's hand, and she was threatened with throttling if she attempted to raise an alarm. The two men bound her with a cord and carried her into the room opening from the passage. They then left her, vowing with terrible oaths to return and do for her if she dared make the slightest disturbance. "'There isn't a room on the other side of the passage, is there, Tim?' demanded Josh of his companion who carried the light no and now let's creep up the stairs as gentle as if we were mice said the snammer you've got your barkers tim asked peddler yes and a damned good clasp knife too replied the ruffian with a significant leer at his accomplice and speaking in a low whisper i don't think we shall find anyone else in the house beside the old woman and ben bones himself cause mutton faced sal is a devilish keen one and she would have found it out if there were any lodgers "'We'll cut upstairs, Tim,' said Josh Pedler, "'and don't let us be a-standin' here paveling, "'or the old scamp may overhear us "'and get out of the back windows or some such a dodge. "'I'll go first, if you like.' "'No, I'll go first, Josh,' answered the stammer, "'for it's me that has got the most spite against the ancient villain.' With these words, Tim Splint crept cautiously up the narrow and dirty staircase, Josh Pedler following closely behind him. The robbers stopped at the door on the first landing and knocked, but no answer being returned, they broke it open in a few minutes by means of a small stout chisel such as the housebreakers are in the habit of using. "'Who's there?' cried the deep sepulchral voice of Old Death as he started up from the armchair in which he had been taking a nap. "'It's only two of your friends,' returned Tim the Snammer. "'And as friends, you had better treat us too, or it'll be the worse for you.' i don't know that i've ever treated you in any way but as friends said old death glancing somewhat uneasily from the one to the other as for you tim i can guess why you're angry with me but i wasn't at liberty it wasn't my own master i can assure you on that saturday when i promised to get you out of that jug or i should have kept my word but it's long a story to tell you now even if I was disposed to do so, and so the shortest way to make us all right is for me to give you back the money that was placed in my hands by Josh Pedler, and what'll pay me for the two months of quad that I had all through you, you cheating old fence, demanded Tim Splint, placing his back against the door in a determined manner. I couldn't help it, Tim, I couldn't help it, returned old Death with a hideous grin, and maybe... 
Maybe, he said with a hesitation habitual to him, I can put something in your way that will make up for the past. Well, that looks like business at all events, observed Tim, exchanging a rapid glance with his companion, for it struck the two robbers at the same moment that they should perhaps act prudently to join Old Death in any enterprise which he may have in hand and then plunder him afterwards, provided that the affair he had to propose gave promise of a better booty than that which they stood immediate chance of obtaining from him. Old Death looked leisurely around the small, mean, and ill-furnished room as much as to say, "'What can you possibly hope to get out of me?' For the meaning of the glances which he had observed to pass between the two robbers was perfectly well understood by him. "'Is the business you hinted at for tonight?' demanded Josh Pedler after a brief pause. "'For tonight,' replied Benjamin Bones. "'But sit down, my good friends, and maybe I can find a dram of brandy in the bottle for you.' "'Thank you. We'll stand, old chap,' said the snammer. But we shan't refuse the bingo for all that. Old Death regaled his two visitors, each with a wine glass full of brandy, and then took a similar quantity himself. Yes, he said, continuing the discourse, it is for tonight, and a good thing may be made of it if you're staunch and resolute. In fact, I wanted to meet with a couple of such active fellows as you are for i've been sadly used lately in more ways than one well what is it demanded tim the snammer you know that we're the lads to do anything it ought to be done and i don't see the use of wasting time if the business is really for tonight i have had positive information continued old death his dark eyes gleaming snake-like behind the shaggy brows that overhung them that a gentleman who lives in a lonely house not many miles off this morning received a considerable sum of money at a banker's on a check which he had cashed there and in a few days he will pay it away to his creditors for he has been building a great number of houses in norwood and so i think added bones with a horrible chuckle and it would be just as well to anticipate him and you can rely on this information asked tim the stammer come let us know all the particulars two or three days ago he took into his service a man named john jeffreys a groom who was lately in the household of sir christopher blunt said old death and this person sells his secrets to those who pay him best in plain terms he's in your pay exclaimed josh pedler well that's all right what's next nothing more than if you'd like to crack his crib you can do it tonight and i'll smash the notes which will be of no use to you till they're melted into gold answered old death thereby intimating to them first that he should take no active part in the business and secondly that it would not be worth their while to cheat him of his share of the plunder inasmuch as they were totally dependent on him for rendering the hoped-for booty at all available Tim the Slammer and Josh Pedler consulted together for a few moments in low whispers. "'But how do we know,' said the former, suddenly turning round upon Old Death, "'that this isn't all a cursed plan to get us out of your house here, or maybe to inveigle us into some infernal trap, eh? Answer us that.' "'Read John Jeffrey's note,' said Old Death coolly, as he produced the letter from the pocket of his capacious old grey surtout coat. Tim the Snammer and Josh Peddler accordingly read the contents of the paper, which ran as follows. This comes to tell you, sir, that Master received a check for about twelve hundred pounds yesterday from Sir Henry Courtenay, a barrow knight, and that Master got it cashed this morning at the bank, which I know, cause I got to go with him in the gig to the bank, and I see him come out of the bank, accounting his notes, and I know he will pay it all away in two or three days to the builders and architects and carpenters at Norwood. Anything you leave for me in a brown paper parcel at the Ushaw crib will reach me. Your faithful servant, J.J. Satisfactory now, exclaimed Tin the Snammer with an appealing glance to his comrade, who nodded his head approvingly. Well, continued the thief, give us the necessary description of the place, and we'll be off at once. It's fortnight that we've got our tools about us.
which you have used against my miserable lodging observed old death with a grim smile however i would rather you'd have introduced yourselves in that way than not come at all for i should have let this matter he added pointing to geoffrey's note which now lay on the table go by without attending to it so it's lucky for us all that you did make your appearance and if you serve me well in this case you shall not want employment of my finding good again old tulip said tim the snammer and now tell us where this mr torrings lives or whatever his name is and we will lose no time old death gave the necessary explanation and the two men took their departure having first acquainted their employer with the condition in which they had left the old woman downstairs a piece of information which made him hasten to her rescue end of section eighty Section 81 of The Mysteries of London, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Gillian Hendry. The Mysteries of London, Volume 3 by George W. M. Reynolds. The Father and Daughter. Proceed we now to Torrens Cottage, on the road to which place we have just left Tim the Snammer and Josh Pedler. It was past eleven o'clock, and Mr. Torrens was seated alone in his parlour, examining a pile of papers which lay before him, a decanter more than half emptied of its ruby contents, and a wine-glass also stood upon the table, and the flushed countenance of the unprincipled man showed that he had sought to drown the remorseful feelings of a restless conscience by means of the juice of the grape but he could not and though ten days had now elapsed since the sacrifice of the beautiful rosamond had taken place there were moments when the father felt even more acutely than on the fatal night when in the solitude of his chamber he endured the torments of the damned mental torments indescribably more severe than the most agonizing of physical pain could possibly be he had received the price of his infamy and her dishonour, the last portion of the price of blood he had drawn from the bankers in the morning, and he was now arranging and casting up his accounts to satisfy himself that he had actually obtained sufficient to settle all his liabilities. But his occupation was every moment interrupted by a gush of terrible thoughts to his maddening brain, and if he laid down the pen it was to grasp the bottle. What would the world say if his black turpitude were to transpire? How should he ever be able to meet Clarence Villiers and Adelaide again, if they were to become acquainted with Rosamond's dishonour? He knew that the baronet had hitherto managed somewhat to tranquillise the ruined girl by promises of marriage and eternal affection. He was also aware that Rosamond had endeavoured to subdue her anguish as much as possible, in order to avoid the chance of arousing any suspicion on the part of Mrs. Slingsby. But a term must at length arrive to those specious representations and mendacious assurances adopted by Sir Henry Courtney to lull the agonising feelings of the unhappy girl. And then, oh, it was then, that the danger would be terrible indeed. Of all this Mr. Torrens thought and he suffered more acutely from his fears than from his consciousness of infernal iniquity. The timepiece upon the mantel had struck the hour of eleven some time, and Mr. Torrance was in the midst of his terrible meditations, when a loud, long, and impatient knock at the front door caused him to start from his seat. He had already desired the servants not to sit up on his account, as it was probable that he should be occupied with his papers until a late hour in the night, and he was therefore now compelled to answer the summons himself. A cold chill struck his heart, for he entertained a presentiment of what was about to occur. Indeed, such an anticipation was natural on his part, when we reflect that his soul was a prey to conscious guilt, and that the knock at the door was hasty and imperative. For a moment he staggered as if about to fall, then, calling all his firmness to his aid, he proceeded to open the front door, the knocking at which was repeated with increased vehemence. 
his presentiment was correct, for scarcely had he drawn back the bolt when the door was pushed open, and Rosamond rushed into the house. "'My dearest father!' she exclaimed, and fell insensible into his arms. He conveyed her to a sofa in the parlour, tore off her bonnet and shawl, and sprinkled water upon her pale, her very pale countenance. Merciful heavens! How acute, how agonising was the pang which shot to his heart, as he contemplated that lovely brow, on which innocence had so lately sat enthroned, until the spoiler had pressed the heated lips of lust thereon. Then for a few moments all the father's feelings were uppermost in his soul, and he gnashed his teeth with rage at the thought that he himself was dishonoured in that dishonoured daughter. Oh, to have given her back her purity and her self-respect! To have known that she could raise her head proudly in maiden pride! To have been able to embrace her as the chaste and spotless being she was, ere hell suggested its accursed machinations to achieve her destruction! But it was too late. Here lay the ruined child, and there were piled the notes and gold which had purchased her virtue. Three or four minutes elapsed, and still Rosamond gave no signs of returning animation. Suddenly the father desisted from his endeavours to restore her, for an infernal thought flashed to his mind. He would suffer her to die. No sooner did the atrocious idea enter his soul than he longed to see it fulfilled. He dared not meet her eye, even should she be unsuspicious relative to his unnatural treachery. No, it were better that she should die. But the infernal hopes of the wicked man were not to be realised, and, monster that he was, he could not slay her with his own hands. Slowly, at length, her bosom began to heave. A profound sigh escaped her. She opened her eyes and gazed vacantly around. Rosamond, said her father, now mastering his feelings of bitter disappointment so far as to be able to speak in a kind tone. "'Rosamond, dearest, what ails you? Fear not, you are at home. But why do you look at me so wildly?' "'Oh, my God, what have I done, that I should have deserved so much misery?' exclaimed the young girl, in a voice of the most piercing anguish, as she covered her face with her hands, and burst into a flood of tears. Then, raising herself to a sitting posture on the sofa, she seized her father's hands, saying in a different and more profoundly melancholy tone, "'My parent, my only friend, I am unworthy to look you in the face.' "'Do not speak thus, Rosamond,' said Mr. Torrance, seating himself by his daughter's side, and maintaining a demeanour which bespoke the deepest interest in her behalf." "'Something has cruelly afflicted you,' he added interrogatively, as if he had yet the fatal truth to learn. "'Oh, heavens! Your kindness kills me, dearest father!' shrieked Rosamond. "'Yes, never did you appear so kind to me before, and I, I... But, merciful saviour, my brain is on fire!' "'My sweet child,' returned Mr. Torrance, whose soul was a perfect hell as he listened to the words which came from his daughter's lips. "'You can surely have no secrets from me. Has any one caused you chagrin? Has any one dared to insult you? And what means this sudden arrival at home, at so late an hour, and when I fancied that you were staying with that excellent woman, Mrs. Slingsby?' "'Mrs. Slingsby!' repeated Rosamond with a shudder which denoted the loathing and abhorrence she entertained for that woman. "'Oh, my dear father, that Mrs. Slingsby is a fiend in human shape, a vile and detestable hypocrite, who conceals the blackest heart beneath the garb of religion!' "'Rosamond, Rosamond, you know not what you are saying!' exclaimed Mr. Torrance, affecting to be profoundly surprised and even hurt at these emphatic accusations." "'Alas, I know too well, oh, far too well, the truth of all I am saying,' said Rosamond, a hectic glow of excitement appearing upon her cheeks, hitherto so ashy pale. "'Yes, father, that woman is a disgrace to her sex, 
this evening but two hours ago i accidentally heard a few words pass between her and sir henry courtney sir henry courtney is at least an honourable man said mr torrance sir henry courtney is a monster cried rosamond emphatically then bursting into tears again she threw herself at her father's feet exclaiming oh that i had a mother to whom i could unburden all the woes that fill my heart but to you to you my dearest parent how can your daughter confess that she has been ruined dishonoured undone unhappy girl cried the hypocrite affecting a tone and manner denoting mingled indignation and astonishment what dreadful things are these that you have come home to tell me the truth my dear father the horrible fatal truth continued rosamond in a fearfully excited tone speak lower lower my child said mr torrens the servants will be alarmed they will overhear you and now resume your seat near me rise from that humiliating posture and humiliating indeed interrupted rosamond sinking her voice to a comparative whisper but with an utterance that was almost suffocated by the dreadful emotions raging within her bosom because i myself am so signally humiliated she added and yet i am innocent dear father it was not my fault not for worlds would i have strayed from the path of virtue but a hideous plot a diabolical scheme of treachery devised between that bad woman and that still more dreadful man no more no more rosamond exclaimed mr torrens still maintaining a well-affected semblance of indignation and astonishment i understand you but too well and you shall be avenged alas vengeance will not make me what i once was a happy and spotless girl said rosamond and now that i am dishonoured it would require but the contumely with which the world would treat me to drive me to utter desperation to madness or to suicide mr torrens said all he could to console his unhappy child and he very readily promised her to abandon all ideas of vengeance on those who had been the authors of her shame until this evening said rosamond her head reclining upon her father's shoulder i had hoped that sir henry courtney would repair the wrong he had done me by means of marriage for alas my dear father i loved him but two hours ago i overheard a few words pass between him and mrs slingsby a few words which riveted me to the spot where i was at first only an involuntary listener then i became a willing and attentive eavesdropper for oh the little which had already met my ears intimately too intimately regarded myself and dear father you can conceive with what horror and dismay i learnt enough to convince me that she whom i had loved and esteemed as a dear friend and a model of perfection was a vile an abandoned an infamous woman the mistress of sir henry courtney and in the way to become a mother also i could not believe my ears i fancied that i was dreaming but alas it was indeed a frightful reality and then i heard that i had been sold yes sold i your daughter sold to sir henry courtney and i suppose by that dreadful woman yes yes father she continued wildly i was sold to his arms and he never intended to marry me i screamed not i uttered not a word i was crushed too low i had too great a load of misery upon my soul to be able to give vent to my feelings but i dragged myself away from the spot where i had overheard that terrible discourse a veil had fallen from before my eyes and i saw all the extent of my hopeless position in its true light how i managed to reach my bedroom i know not my brain began to whirl and i thought that i should go mad of what followed i have but a dim recollection but methinks that having put on my bonnet and shawl i was flying from the house when sir henry courtney pursued me down the stairs and how i escaped from him i cannot say there was a chaos in my bewildered brain and when i was enabled to collect my scattered thoughts when consciousness as i may term it came back i found myself hurrying along the streets 
I looked round, fearful of being pursued, but there was no cause for alarm. Nevertheless, I hastened on, and all that long distance have I accomplished on foot, dear father, for, oh, I felt that home was the place where my deep sorrows would receive sympathy, and where only I could hope to enjoy security. And now, my beloved parent, added Rosamond, throwing her arms around his neck, you will not spurn your unhappy daughter, you will not thrust her from you. My God, why did I ever reveal to you all this? Oh, it was because my heart was so full of woe, that if I had not unburdened it to you, in the hope of receiving consolation, it would have broken, it would have broken. Rosamond, said Mr. Torrance, you did well to reveal all these dreadful things to me, because I alone am the proper person to counsel and console you. A fearful crime, he continued, shuddering at his own monstrous duplicity, has been perpetrated, but alas, the criminals must go unpunished. Yes, Rosamond, you were right when you declared that vengeance would lead only to exposure, and that exposure would kill you. My poor child, not even your sister must be made acquainted with this awful calamity. No, no, exclaimed Rosamond. It is sufficient that you are aware of this ignominious treatment which I have received. Not for worlds would I have the bridal happiness of my dearest sister poisoned by the revelation of my wrongs. And Clarence, too, Clarence, oh, from him of all men must this secret be kept. Or he would, perhaps, be urged to wreak on his aunt, or on that vile baronet, a vengeance which would lead to exposure, and render Adelaide miserable for ever. It charms me, Rosamond, said Mr. Torrance, to perceive that the wrongs heaped upon you have not impaired your prudence. Between you and me shall this secret now remain. For, depend upon it, the authors of this cruel outrage will not themselves be anxious to publish their own infamy. You are now beneath the paternal roof, and here you are certain to enjoy security, and from this night forth, Rosamond, let us place a seal on our lips, so far as the one dread topic is concerned. And you, my father, asked the ruined girl, shall you not love me the less? Shall you not look with loathing and abhorrence upon your daughter? Oh, if there be a change in your sentiments towards me, I shall have no alternative save to die. The miserable and criminal father embraced his dishonoured child, and said everything he could to console her. Rosamond then retired to her chamber, that chamber which she had left ten days previously, a pure and spotless virgin and to which she now returned a deflowered and ruined girl. Mr. Torrance remained in the parlour. Amidst all the horrible thoughts that forced themselves upon his mind, he saw one glimmering of consolation, and this was that Rosamond suspected not his complicity in the nefarious plot which had destroyed her. It was evident that in the conversation which she had overheard between Mrs. Slingsby and the baronet, his connivance had only been hinted at, too darkly and mysteriously for Rosamond to comprehend the meaning of those words which alluded to the fact of her having been sold. But what pen can describe the tortures which the guilty man experienced as he pondered on the scene that had just occurred? In spite of that gleam of solace, he was the prey to ineffable anguish, for he could not help feeling as a father. Nature asserted her empire and he was in despair as he contemplated the awful crime which had led to the dishonour of his own child. Never had she appeared to him so beautiful as when, ashy pale, she had awakened from the deep trance into which she fell on crossing the parental threshold. Never did he feel more inclined to love her, or to be proud of her charms, than when he afterwards saw her kneeling at his feet, the light of the lamp falling with Rembrandt effect upon her upraised countenance. Alas, through him was she ruined, by his machinations was she destroyed, and of what avail was that beauty now, since honour was lost? He fixed his eyes upon the gold, and endeavoured to console himself with the contemplation of the glittering metal. It seemed dross, vile dross in his eyes, and could he have recalled the deeds of the last ten days, 
he would gladly have fallen back into the inextricable labyrinth of his pecuniary difficulties, and have dared even the disgrace and punishment of a debtor's prison, so that he might not have had to reproach himself with the sale of his daughter's virtue. End of section 81《Section 82 of the Mysteries of London, Volume 3. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The Mysteries of London, Volume 3, by George W. M. Reynolds. Chapter 78 Retribution. It was long past midnight, and Mr. Torrens was still pacing the parlour with uneven steps when a low double knock at the front door aroused him from his painful meditations. Wondering who could visit the cottage at that late hour, he hastened to reply to the summons, and to his surprise, the lustre of the parlour lamp which he carried in his hand streamed full upon the pale and agitated countenance of Sir Henry Courtenay. Making a sign to the baronet not to speak, Mr. Torrens led the way into the parlour and the visitor in the excitement of the feelings which had brought him to the cottage neglected to shut the front door close as he entered but merely pushed it back in such a way that the bolt of the lock did not catch this little incident was unperceived by the two gentlemen when they were both in the parlour mr torrens shut the room door and said in a low whisper she has come home thank god she is safe then observed the baronet also in a subdued voice the fact is, Mrs. Slingsby and myself were so dreadfully frightened that she might either make away with herself, or else adopt some measure that would lead to a certain exposure, that we have both been hunting for her through all the streets at the West End, and at last I determined, late as it was, to come over and acquaint you with her flight. But it never struck me that I should hear of her return home. She is unaware of my sad complicity in the dreadful business, replied Mr. Torrin sternly but pray repeat to me the whole conversation which took place between Mrs. Slingsby and yourself, and which she unfortunately overheard. I shall then be enabled to judge whether reflection on that discourse may lead her to imagine that her own father was indeed a party to her ruin, for I must confess that I have terrible fears lest she should indeed imbibe such a suspicion. Give me a tumbler of wine, Torin, said the baronet, throwing himself upon the sofa which had so lately been pressed by his victim when in a state of insensibility. I am regularly exhausted, for I have walked all the way hither, and when I have a little recovered myself I will detail all the conversation which took place between me and Mrs. Slingsby, as nearly as I shall be able to recollect it. Mr. Torrance produced the bottle of wine from the sideboard, he having already emptied the decanter upon the table help yourself sir henry he said and in the meantime i will steal cautiously upstairs and see if rosamond be yet retired to rest for i would not for worlds have her come down and find you here a wise precaution observed the baronet mr torrens accordingly quitted the parlour and hastened upstairs he stopped at the door of his daughter's chamber and listened profound sobs and impassioned ejaculations indicative of terrible grief met his ears and he grew alarmed lest she should feel herself so thoroughly wretched and lonely as to be unable to sleep, and perhaps return to the parlour. He accordingly knocked gently at the door, and Rosamond speedily opened it. She had not as yet divested herself of a particle of her clothing, nor made any preparation to retire to rest, and her countenance was so truly woebegone, so thoroughly the picture of a deeply seated grief, that even her iron-hearted father was affected to tears she threw her arms around his neck and thanked him for his kind solicitude he remained with her nearly a half hour exerting all his power of language to console her and the anxiety which he experienced to induce her to seek her couch so that he might return to the parlour and get rid of sir henry courtenay as soon as possible rendered him so eloquent and so effective in the to him novel art of administering solace that he succeeded fully now i am convinced that you do not loathe despise and hate your daughter said rosamond at length and this impression has removed an immense weight from my mind though true happiness may never bore be mine yet shall i find a substitute in christian resignation to my fate and henceforth dear father i will not make you unhappy by compelling you to act the part of a comforter and now good night my only friend my beloved parent and fear not that I shall give way again to that violent outpouring of grief in which you so kindly interrupted me. Mr. Torrens embraced his daughter, 
and a pang shot to his heart as he thought of his infernal conduct toward that good and affectionate girl. As he descended the stairs, he heard her lock her chamber door, and he was just congratulating himself upon the success of his attempt to console her, when the murmuring sounds of voices, apparently coming from the front parlour, caused him to redouble his pace thither, for the idea flashed to his mind that Mrs. Slingsby might also have visited the cottage in her alarm concerning Rosamond, and that the baronet had probably afforded her admission while he was upstairs with his daughter. Tim the Snammer and Josh Pedler, bent on their predatory intent and hoping to reap a good harvest at the house of Mr. Torrens, approached that dwelling nearly half an hour after Sir Henry Courtenay had entered it. Perceiving a light gleaming from the divisions in the parlour shutters, they crept cautiously up to the window, and through those crevices beheld the glittering gold piled upon the table, and a person lying upon the sofa apparently in a profound sleep. The fact was that the baronet was completely exhausted with his long walk from old Burlington Street to the cottage, and having tossed off a tumbler of wine, he lay down on the sofa to await Mr. Torrens' return. But we have seen that the father had found his daughter in such a state of profound affliction as to be totally unable to leave her for nearly half an hour, and during that interval an irresistible drowsiness stole over Sir Henry Courtenay, speedily wrapping him in a deep slumber. Tim the Snammer and Josh Pedler were determined to risk the crack, in spite of the sleeper whom they descried upon the sofa, and whom they believed to be Mr. Torrens, for neither was this gentleman nor the baronet known to them by sight. With their housebreaking implements they were on the point of making an attempt on the front door, when it yielded to their touch and swung noiselessly open. At this they were not at all surprised, for it immediately struck them that John Jeffreys had expected the visit that night, and had left the door ajar on purpose. They stole into the house and succeeded in entering the parlour without arousing the baronet. Tim the Snammer instantly drew forth his clasp-knife, and bending over Sir Henry Courtenay held the murderous weapon close to his throat, while Josh Pedler hastily secured the notes and gold about his person. "'We may as well have the plate, if there is any,' whispered this individual to his companion. "'In fact, we'll have a regular ransack of the place, and if he awakes, I'll cut his infernal throat in a jiffy," added Tim the Snammer. Josh grinned in approval of this summary mode of proceeding, and opened one of the sideboard drawers. But the noise which a sugar basin or some such article made inside the drawer, by falling over with the sudden jerk, aroused the sleeper. Sir Henry Courtenay started, opened his eyes, beheld a strange countenance hanging over him, and was about to utter a cry of alarm when the terrible clasp-knife was drawn rapidly and violently across his throat. There was a dull gurgling noise, a convulsive quivering of the entire frame, but not a groan, much less an exclamation of terror, and Sir Henry Courtenay was no more. "'Come along, Tim,' said Josh Pedler, whose face was ghastly pale. "'We've done enough for to-night.' "'Yes, let us be off,' returned the murderer, now shuddering at the dreadful deed which he had just perpetrated." and they were issuing from the room when the noise of footsteps on the stairs made them redouble their speed to gain the front door. It was Mr. Torrens, who had thus alarmed them, but they escaped without molestation, for when that gentleman reached the hall and beheld two men rushing towards the front door, he was himself seized with such profound terror, painfully strung as his feelings had been that night, that he was for a few moments stupefied and riveted to the spot. But when he saw the front door close behind the strangers he took courage, hastily secured it within, and then hurried to the parlour in agony of fear, lest his gold and notes should have become the prey of plunderers. One glance at the table was sufficient. The money was gone. Mr. Torrance dashed his open palm against his forehead with frantic violence, and was about to utter a cry of rage and despair when the remembrance of his unhappy daughter sealed his lips. At the same instance he looked towards the sofa. But holy God, what a spectacle met his view! for there lay the baronet with his head nearly severed from his body, murdered, barbarously murdered, upon the very sofa where his victim had so late reposed in trance-like insensibility. On that sofa slept he his last sleep, and even in that appalling moment when Mr. Torrens recoiled, shuddering and shocked, from the dreadful sight, it struck him that there was something of retributive justice, not only in the loss of his own treasure, but also in the death of Sir Henry Courtenay. The frightened man uttered not a murmur as that spectacle encountered his eyes. His amazement was of so stupefying a nature that it sealed his lips, 
paralyzed his powers of utterance. With staring orbs he gazed on the grisly corpse from which he recoiled staggeringly, and several minutes elapsed ere he could so far command his presence of mind as even to become aware of his own dreadful predicament. But as the truth dawned upon him he was seized with indescribable alarms, with horrible apprehensions. The double crime of robbery and murder had been perpetrated so speedily and so noiselessly that not a soul in the house was alarmed by any unusual sound and Mr. Torrens felt the sickening conviction that it would be a difficult thing to persuade a jury that he himself was innocent. Suspicion must inevitably attach itself to him. Circumstantial evidence would be strong against him. In a word, the appalling truth broke in upon him that he would be accused of the assassination of Sir Henry Courtenay. Mr. Torrens sat down, and burying his face in his hands fell into a profound but most painful meditation. Should he raise an alarm, arouse Jeffreys and the female servant as well as his daughter, and proclaim all he knew about that horrible transaction? No. Something whispered in his ear that he would not be believed. Rosamond, not knowing that he was the baronet's accomplice in achieving her dishonor, would naturally conceive that the murder was the result of paternal vengeance. It was then impossible to suffer the occurrence to transpire. But what was he to do with the body? how dispose of it terrible dilemma all the atrocity of his crime towards his daughter now returned with a tremendously augmenting intensity to his mind his punishment on earth had already begun he was doomed accursed wretched man gold was thy destroyer ah gold but thou hast lost thy gold and in a few days the creditors who yet remain unpaid will be upon thee but what does such an idea actually strike him, urging him to plunder the murdered victim of any coin which there may be about the corpse? Yes, and now behold the father who sold the honor of his child about to examine the pockets of that child's assassinated ravisher. The purse contains some fifteen or sixteen sovereigns, and these Mr. Torrens self-appropriates. The pocket-book of the deceased is next scrutinized, but there are no bank-notes, nothing save papers and memoranda, totally valueless. Mr. Torin stamps his foot with rage. His predicament is truly awful. Ruin still menaces him on one side in respect to his affairs, for having reckoned on the money to be produced by the sale of his daughter's virtue, he had contracted fresh liabilities within the last ten days. And on the other side is the terrible danger in which the presence of that corpse may involve him. Add to these sources of agonizing feelings, the conviction that the sacrifice of Rosamond will, after all, have proved ineffectual in respect to the complete settlement of his affairs, even should he succeed in burying the more serious event, namely the murder, in impenetrable mystery, and the wretched state of mind in which Mr. Torrens was now plunged may be conceived. He rose from the chair on which he had a second time flung himself after plundering the corpse and approached the timepiece. It was half-past one o'clock. But as Mr. Torrens glanced at the dial, which thus told him how short an interval remained for him to take some decisive step, if he really intended to dispose of the corpse before the servants should be stirring, he caught a glimpse of his countenance in the mirror over the mantel. He recoiled. He shrank back with horror. Was it indeed his own countenance that he saw? Or was it that of some unquiet ghost wandering near the spot where its mortal tenement had been cruelly murdered? He turned round suddenly to avoid farther contemplation of that ghastly visage, and again he recoiled from an object of terror, staggered and would have fallen had he not caught the back of a chair for support. For in the half-open doorway he beheld a human face, which was withdrawn the moment his eyes encountered it. Driven to desperation and reckless now of what might happen to him, the maddened man rushed into the hall in time to observe a figure turn the angle of the staircase. In another moment he had caught the figure by the arm, and dragging the person forcibly down, he held his new manservant, John Jeffreys, by the light of the lamp streaming from the open parlour door. Totally forgetful at the instance of the presence of the corpse in the room, so terribly excited and bewildered was he, Mr. Torrens dragged Jeffreys into the parlour to demand the reason why he was up and dressed at that hour of the night, or rather morning and it was not until he saw the man himself turn ghastly pale as his eyes encountered the hideous spectacle on the sofa that Mr. Torrens remembered the frightful oversight which he had committed. 
Then hastening to close up the room door, which he locked also, Mr. Torrens said, Why are you up? And wherefore were you prying about the house? The fact was that Jeffreys had expected a visit from some of Old Death's gang that night, and had never retired to bed at all. He heard the two double knocks at the door, the first being that given by Rosamond, and the other by the baronet. And when the robbers had quitted the house, closing the front door after them, Jeffreys thought it must be the last visitor, whoever he might be, going away. After that the house had remained quiet for some little time, and Jeffreys fancied that Mr. Torrens had retired to bed. He had accordingly stolen down from his bedroom to unfasten a window-shutter, and thus render the ingress of the expected robbers an easy matter. But perceiving a light in the parlour, he began to suspect that they must be already there. Accordingly he crept cautiously up to the door, and was for a moment stupefied when he obtained a glimpse of the reflection of his master's ghastly countenance in the mirror, a view of which he could command from the hall. "'Why are you up, and wherefore were you prying about the house?' demanded Mr. Torrens. "'The truth is, sir, I heard a noise just now, and I was afeard that thieves was breaking in,' was the ready reply. "'So I got up and dressed, but, sir,' he glanced significantly towards the dead body. "'Jeffreys,' said Mr. Torrens, in a hurried and excited tone, "'a dreadful event has occurred to-night. "'This gentleman came to call upon me late on very particular business. "'I left him here while I went upstairs to speak to my daughter who has returned home, "'and on coming downstairs again I saw two men escaping from the house. "'When I entered the parlour a considerable sum of money which I had left on the table was gone, "'and my poor friend was as you now see him.' The manservant believed the tale, but he affected not to do so, for he was villain enough to rejoice at such an opportunity of getting his master completely in his power. "'You smile incredulously, John,' said Mr. Torrens, "'and yet I take heaven to witness.' "'It's orchard, sir, very orchard,' observed Jeffreys, "'and maybe it'll lead to scragging if the stiffen isn't put away.' Mr. Torrens shuddered from head to foot. "'What do you mean to do, sir?' asked Jeffreys. "'I am quite ready to assist you, but it's getting on for two o'clock.' "'Yes, I know it,' interrupted Mr. Torrens. "'I am mad. I am driven to desperation. What would you advise? But will you be faithful? Will you keep the secret? I can reward you.' "'We'll talk of that another time, sir,' said Jeffreys. "'For the present let's think of making away with the stiffen. We must bury it. Stay here a moment, sir, while I go and get the stable lantern and a sack. Or rather, observed Mr. Torrens, I will fetch some water to wash the carpet.' Fortunately the blood has not trickled upon the sofa. Noiselessly the two crept away from the parlour, one to the stables, the other to the kitchen. In a few moments they met again by the side of the corpse, which they thrust into the sack, and between them the load was conveyed to the stable. "'You go and clean the carpet, sir,' said John Jeffreys, whose superior presence of mind served to invest him with authority to direct the proceedings, while I dig a hole in the garden. Mr. Torrens hastened to obey the suggestion of his servant, and returned to the parlour, where he cleansed the carpet as well as he could. He then took a bottle of port wine from the sideboard and broke it over the very spot where the blood had dripped down, leaving the fractured glass strode about and drawing the table near the sofa, so as to produce the appearance of the bottle having been accidentally knocked off it. Nearly half an hour was consumed in this occupation, and Mr. Torrens, whose mind was already much relieved, hastened back to the garden, where Jeffreys was busily engaged in digging a grave for the murdered baronet. When the servant was tired, his master took a turn with the spade, and as the soil was not particularly hard, an hour saw the completion of the labor. The corpse was thrown into the hole, and the earth was shoveled over it, each layer being well stamped down by the feet. When the task was accomplished, Mr. Torrens and Jeffreys re-entered the house, and ere they separated to retire to their respective rooms, the former said in a low whisper, Once more I conjure you to maintain this secret inviolable, and I will find means to reward you well for the present take this. And he slipped ten sovereigns, a portion of the murdered baronet's money, into the hands of Jeffreys. Don't be afeard that I'm leaky, sir, responded the man, clutching the gold and consigning it to his pocket, where he had already stowed away the baronet's handsome repeater and gold rings, to which valuables he had helped himself, while his master was busily engaged in cleansing the carpet in the parlour. For Mr. Torrance had merely plundered the corpse of the contents of the purse, and had not touched the jewellery, through fear that it might lead to the detection of the murder if seen in his possession. Master and man now separated, the former to seek a sleepless couch, and the latter to dream of the good fortune which that night's adventure had brought him. 
and in his unconsecrated grave a victim to the assassin's knife slept the once gay dissipated and unprincipled sir henry courtenay end of section eighty two recording by philip gould